All right. I was just thank you. Okay. Cool. Sorry. Cool. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, kua hui hui mai nei, e mihi ana ki te iwi o wākato te iwi i, I ahua. Uh, he mihi ana ki a Jessica. Uh, nā mihi, nā mihi ki a koutou i tau mai i tēnei rā. Uh, ko Chrissy Payne ping tōko mua. Um, nō rena, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. So, Thank you everyone for coming and sorry for the, for the delay. Um, parking was at a premium today, apparently, at the University of Waikato. Um, so Jess is here visiting us from um, the school, it's a school, it's right? Yeah. School of uh, Science in Society uh, from Victoria University of Wellington. Um, and her research is all about trying to evaluate how people do science communication uh, and engagement with communities. So basically making it more practicable. Is that the word? Is that how I say it? Practicable. She invented it. I don't know. She'll explain it to us, I'm sure. Uh, so Jess is originally from Seattle uh, in the US. Uh, she did her Bachelor of Arts in Biology at Colorado College. Um, she then sort of switched over to doing fisheries science. Um, so did her master's at the University of Washington and looked at salmon migration patterns in her own backyard pretty much where she grew up. Um, and then she kind of switched research directions again. Um, she did a course during her master's on science communication and public speaking and kind of realized that was an interest of hers. Um, so she then took up a job as a community manager um, for a interdisciplinary um, group of researchers who all worked in the Arctic. And she, so she did that for five years, um, but actually ended up kind of combining that with her love of traveling. So she was a digital nomad, probably one of the the OG digital nomads, um, traveling the world for about five years before she ended up here in New Zealand, right as uh, the pandemic hit in early 2020. And so decided kind of that was her time to start her PhD. So she's been doing her PhD since in science communication. Um, and Jess is here because um, she's actually using me as a guinea pig uh, for one of her uh, case studies for her PhD. So trying to figure out how we can evaluate science communication um, and from lots of different perspectives. And so she's been helping me kind of figure out ways that I can uh, evaluate whether outreach and engagement efforts on Rekohu or Whadikauri, Ch Chatham Islands, um, is going to actually be effective. We don't know the answer to that yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll hand over to you, Jess. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much. That's a lot of and thank you all very much for your patience. I'm really sorry about the wait, um, but it's so nice to see all these familiar faces. Um, and I really appreciate your hospitality for the past, it's almost been three weeks now. Um, and you've all been really welcoming and I don't want to leave. <laughs> I'm going to connect you up to this. Great. Yeah, my voice feels a little tight. Testing. Yep. Let's see. Thanks. All right. So yes, I am a PhD candidate. They have given me that title now. However, this is the first time that I've ever talked about my PhD research. So I'm very excited to see what you guys think. And because I'm researching evaluation, I'd really like to know your harshest criticisms at the end so that I can improve it. I meant to bring paper that you could write notes down on, but if you have something that's really harsh and you don't want to say it to my face, maybe just say it to Chrissy and then she'll pass it on to me anonymously. Okay. Yeah, so Chrissy covered this a little bit, so I'll go quickly. I'm from Seattle and I studied fisheries ecology and I traveled a lot um, and I like diving in caves. Um, and I took a little detour while I was doing my master's and I was really lucky that the grad students at my university created a science communication course because one didn't exist yet and they wanted it to exist. They really just started out teaching each other and then they were like, this is actually a thing, let's, let's make it a course. And then they partnered with this local venue called Town Hall and so all the students gave their final capstone presentation about their research in front of a public audience. And so that was my first and scariest public speaking event that I ever did. Um, but it was awesome to tell people about the research that I was so excited about. Um, and that group of students really had this kind of magic to it because we created this thing. So we just kept creating things. We crowdfunded um, an evaluation of the, I'm gonna move that up a little bit, of the course and published it. And that was my first publication that wasn't in fisheries, that was in science communication. 
Um, and from there, I had to wait around a little bit until I finally decided it was time to do the PhD again. I wonder if we can make this go. Yeah. Anyway, so this might look familiar to you. This is um, the peak in COVID infections. And this little dot is when I crossed the border into New Zealand just by, I think it was like four days before the shutdown happened. And I didn't leave for three years. Um, and since then I've left, but now I'm so extremely happy to be here because, well, of course that year of lockdowns and uncertainty was really hard on everybody, but I felt like there was no better science community. I mean, there was no better disease-free place to be in the world, but also there was no better science communication place to be in the world because mm -hmm. New Zealand relied on science and empathy. I just think that's such a great, that's a great sound bite. Um, and Sean Hendy, who's also part of TPM and is really inspirational, like that, that just makes me really emotional to, to know that he felt like I did something to help save lives. Um, so I really like this quote because I'll, should I read it or should I let you read it? We ask scientists and especially young scientists to communicate their work, get a blog, record a podcast, write an op-ed, speak with elected officials, and more. If everyone does this and succeeds, the result will be noise. One big challenge for science communication is to develop mechanisms that produce music, not noise, just as a symphony does. And I like that quote because I think science communication, especially for people who are just researchers in their day job and are trying to squeeze in science communication when they have time, it can be a little haphazard and you can forget that you actually have all of these other musicians around you that you can collaborate with and team up with and you don't have to go it alone. And then you can be more strategic and have more of an impact with the science communication that you're doing. Um, and so that's what really motivated me to get into evaluation. I think that's how we make our science communication actually have an impact. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of interactivity. Um, I'm just going to ask a bunch of types of science communication, or other words you might use are outreach or public engagement or informal science education. I'm just going to put them up there, and I would love it if you could raise your hand if you've ever participated in that. And we're just going to go through it quickly. So science festival. What if we know we're going to? <laughs> Push your hand up. <laughs> uh, science cafe or public talk. Nice. Blogs. Okay. Tweet or X or whatever. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, blogs. Okay. Have you talked to a reporter? Okay. Oh, wow. Brave, brave people. Have you talked to a government official? I feel like the government is quite accessible to scientists here. Um, have you ever done community based research? Oh, cool. Oh, great. Oh, that's awesome. Podcast or YouTube. I had to throw that in there because I know there's at least one. Oh, there's several. Okay, cool. Um, and outreach in schools. Nice. That is awesome. I'm going to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about is what the heck is evaluation? Um, and it can be a little tricky to explain, maybe not quite as awkward as trying to explain the birds and the bees. But um, I thought I'd start with some examples of ways that you guys see evaluations in your everyday life. So if you're teaching here, you have students that are evaluating your teaching. And from what I hear of that, it's either you're the best teacher in the world or you're the worst teacher in the world, right? Because that's what motivates them to actually do the evaluation. So that can be kind of rough. You also go through this peer review process, which is actually like several phases of people reviewing your hard work. Um, and I really like this far side comic that streams lines it down to a little obstacle course. Um, and evaluation often gets compared to that death creature, the Grim Reaper with the scythe, because um, I mean, all those things I just described are like not the most fun things that you do in your job, right? It's pretty much someone external who comes in and tells you, you suppose they're going to tell you all the ways that you're not meeting expectations, right? Um, well, the truth is we actually evaluate all the time, every day, 
we evaluate when we decide if we're going to have a Michelin star meal or girl dinner. <laughs> Yay, some people laughed. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, anytime that you're comparing some new information to some old information and deciding how good or bad it is, you're evaluating informally. Um, so it's actually not that mysterious. Um, it's very similar to research. Oops. Yeah, both research and evaluation are inquiry processes that look very similar. You develop some questions that you're gonna answer, you collect some evidence, you analyze it, and you answer those questions and you report the findings. So while it might seem like there's some mysterious external evaluator who comes in and tells you what you're doing wrong. It's actually something that you're perfectly, anybody is perfectly capable of doing themselves. Um, and there's one key thing that makes evaluation different from research, and that is this thing called valuing. So the researcher cannot tell you how valuable your program is. So what does that mean? This lovely chap right there is Michael Scriven. He's a very well-known evaluator, one of the fathers, and he passed away sadly about a month ago, but he <laughs> made this really excellent quote, bad is bad and good is good, and it's the job of the evaluator to decide which is which. I feel like he was trying to explain it to a five-year-old. Like That's just perfect science communication in my mind. It's basically just deciding the relative value, worth, interest of something. And the way that we make that systematic and call it an evaluation is through something called a rubric. So we say exactly what it takes to be scored at each level of goodness. So excellent would have to be, well, I don't actually have the criteria for getting an excellent grade in there, but you would have to really take your audience into consideration and the context um, and convey your complex ideas simply and clearly, et cetera, et cetera. And you make it transparent so that it can be reproducible. You say, you say exactly why you did what you did. So it seems like a subjective qualitative thing, but this is how we actually make it systematic and quantitative and reproducible. So, I wanted to switch gears and do another little exercise and pretend right now that we are having an amazing science festival here in Wakado with some bugs and some fauna uh, searching for invertebrates in the river and hiking around. And there's also perhaps an amazing storyteller that's um, giving us some magic to the evening. And lots of science learning too, of course. Now, one of the most common ways to evaluate this type of science communication is to send people a survey on a phone and usually at the end when they're leaving. Um, so this is a typical survey and I just wanted you to take a look and think about it for a second and just maybe just give me a reaction. Is it any brave souls want to tell me what they think about that? Yeah. It's a very subjective term. Yeah, totally subjective. Any other words to describe it? It doesn't, it doesn't represent joy. <laughs> ah, doesn't spark joy? Doesn't represent joy. We don't want to break any copyright. <laughs> yeah, yes. Just seems like it wasn't good enough, like satisfied, just like, yeah, okay, I'm satisfied. Yeah. If it helps people, if they want to read that, it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah, because even if you're like, I was extremely satisfied, well, isn't that just satisfied? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, the lack of emotion. I think I would even go so far as to say that it's really doesn't help. It's not useful, it's not helpful doesn't tell you anything other than they were there and they clicked on their screen. Um, and unfortunately, this, well, maybe not unfortunately. The thing about evaluation is you get what you get out of it. So if you're just 
trying to go through your day and you just want to get the survey out and you want to get everybody to say five stars, yeah, it was fine, then that's the survey for you. But if you want to actually get something out of your evaluation and make it useful to you, you probably want to think a little bit harder about what question you're going to ask. Um, Okay, so I'll expand on this a little bit more. I think it's it's really easy to, especially with social media and websites, to look at your followers, your visitors, your impressions, your retweets, um, and to think, oh, wow, that tweet got a lot of retweets. That was a good tweet. I'm doing good. Check science communication. Look, look funder. Lots of tweets. But again, my main point was you don't know anything about what that person took away from it. You don't know anything about them. You don't know if they liked it or they disliked it. You don't know what changed in them as a result of that. Um, so I think when people think of evaluation, the low hanging fruit are these type of vanity metrics. And so one of my main takeaways for you guys today is to try and think beyond that to what kind of information could actually help you. And so to start thinking about that, I wanted to give you another interactive question, which is what do you ultimately in the long term want to happen as a result of the science communication you're doing? And if it's kind of hard to think that far out, maybe pick like one of the things that you raised your hand for, one thing in particular and think, you know, if that thing went really well, what would be the ultimate change that happened? And I'd love it if somebody would share. That's awesome. Yeah, that's such a cool impact. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Saved so many lives. Anybody else? Yeah. When the person typically with a smaller cut is very important, when the person might explaining something to then repeats it back to me in their own words. Yeah. So yeah it's that it's that level of learning where you're what does anybody know it's like you're digesting and putting it in your own words you know it's not digesting but we're talking about squishy things so <laughs> yeah that's a good one that's so it's like that moment for you where where you see that they're activated by it yeah cool i like that yeah and especially if like it gets back to you through that other person <laughs> that's neat uh yeah oh thank you so much Man, I haven't done a Zoom one in a long time. Cool. Does this mean that they still can't see the PowerPoint? Okay. Oh, I was happy to run. I already worked up a sweat today, so I can run around. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you guys for contributing so much. These are great. I feel like it's great. Goals. It at all. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, now I'm looking at the chat. So anybody on Zoom, if you want to add your ultimate goals, I will read them for you. Okay. So um, I just, because so we have a bit of um, time, I, I, I think for me, right, because so, so most of my science communication has been done, I think, on a headcount basis with kids. 
Um, and so for me, I would like to see them view the world through a scientific lens and ask why and how does this work? Yeah. Because when you're talking with kids who are only 12 to 15 years old, um, you're not going to make a commitment and say, I'm going to study theoretical physics, right? Yeah. But if you can get them to think about the world in a way that's not so obvious, right, away from information that people want to feed to them as opposed to you know and and start thinking about well how can i find out more about this for myself yeah right and then more importantly and that what 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 sustains that is that curiosity and then i think for some kids knowing that they actually have the the intellect and access to resources to answer those questions for themselves because i think that's ultimately what gets more people into science and I think also importantly, even if they don't study science formally, they carry that attitude through their life and start looking at the world through a scientific lens. Yeah. Um, because scientists can generate all the evidence we want. But if the people who are making the decisions, they're not viewing the world through a scientific lens, they're lo looking at the world through an ideological lens, then none of the evidence matters. Yeah. That's a really well said well thought out impact. I think if I would, uh, if I could condense it to one where I'd say inspiring curiosity, right? That's the key word is, or maybe critical thinking also, or maybe I would also say inspiring them to become scientists. Cool. Lots of great thoughts there. Anybody on the Zoom wanna share your, why you do science communication? So I think Lisa had said, has there been a behavior change or attitudinal change as a result of the science communication, which is yeah, similar to what? Well, that is the ultimate question, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Take it. I think I have one more interactive part. Okay. Well, I was amazed at your ideas because nobody said just increasing knowledge. Has Have you all heard of the deficit model of science communication? No. Yes. Yes. Um, this is a model in science communication theory that we often have to debunk. Um, I mean, even I am guilty of this thinking. It's probably why I got into science communication. So you, you come into science communication and you think, if I can just tell somebody this knowledge that I know, then they will behave the way that they should be, if I can tell them that climate change is real, then they will reduce their emissions and blah, blah, blah. What the research shows again and again and again is just knowing about science doesn't change your attitudes about it. It doesn't change your behavior towards it. Knowledge is not enough, but knowledge and other engaging parts of science communication can be enough. So sparking curiosity or getting them so excited that they're explaining it back to you or they're going and telling their friend. Um, generally just things that are like giving them a positive experience while they're learning are the types of things that help. So none of you even set any goals that were just like raise awareness. So you're already way ahead of the game. Um, some other goals that you might think of in the long term, although these are admittedly hard to um, they're very long term and hard to evaluate, you know, if this was a result of your science communication or not, but seeking particular policy positions, more funding for your area of research in general, health outcomes such as preventing pandemics, um, promoting science as a career, we got that one. Um, and I also like the, the goal of making science and science communication more inclusive and equitable. Um, and you guys had great ideas. So if, unless anybody wants to pipe up with one last impact, I'll go on to the next thing. Oh, man. There. Okay. Switching gears again. So the definition that we used before is evaluation is research plus valuing. Another way that evaluation can be defined is it's a method for measuring your progress towards your goals. And we just talked about some of our goals. So now we can think about how we can get there. Um, 
this research and theory has been really influential to my thinking around evaluation. It's by John Besley and Anthony Dudo and their strategic communicators. And they developed this theory of strategic science communication in which you develop a long-term behavioral goal, which you guys named some great ones, like getting people to stop squishing bugs. And then you think of some short-term measurable objectives that would logically help lead to that goal. And those are usually in the cognitive and affective domain. So like changing people's feelings about something such as liking bugs, having a positive reaction to bugs when they see them, or just um, cognitive means their beliefs about a topic. So beliefs not in the religious way, but beliefs like I believe that bugs are scary. Um, and then now I believe that bugs are my friends and I don't want to kill them, that kind of belief. And then finally, at the end of this strategic progression, we have tactics. And those are the things that most, they get the most press in science communication. You've probably heard that to do good science communication, you should be telling a story, you shouldn't be using jargon, you should be trying to incorporate metaphor, you should listen and have a dialogue. These are all things that are on the tactical level. And so John, Besley, and Dudo are trying to, they're kind of on this mission to get people who are doing science communication, science communicators, to think beyond just telling a story to their long-term goals and how they can meet those with their strategic thinking and their planning and their objectives. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I already did this without the slide. So that's explaining what tactics are. Some of the goals that we talked about are making better health choices and environmental choices, perhaps voting, informed voting, um, career choices, and two other behaviors that, that might be interesting when you're thinking about evaluating are kind of pseudo behaviors. They're not actually somebody doing something. It's accepting science, so not refuting it or spreading disinformation, being being willing to say, okay, yes, science has a role in this topic that we're talking about. And willingness to trust, um, which is definitely a, a not actionable thing. Trust is something that develops over time and you can't really see it when it happens, but you have this feeling of trust growing. So those are pseudo behaviors that could be goals. Man, I just keep going ahead of my slides. It's because this is the first time I'm doing this. I'm sorry, guys. Um, oh, okay, this is great. So those are the types of goals and objectives that you might think of for your audience, but you might also have goals about yourself. So for example, if you're doing community-based research, one of the major points of reasons for doing that is to develop relationships and build on the local knowledge of the people in the community. Um, so your behavior would be changed by being exposed to different knowledge systems, new ways of thinking, new culture, um, and adapting to be more accepting or welcoming of that. Um, or being willing to, in the pseudo behavior realm, being willing to work with different types of audiences. Okay, so we've got our long-term behavioral goals and we've got tactics, which are the little things that you do to, to get to the goals. But in the middle, we have these things that are kind of the black box, the cognitive and effective objectives. And Bessley and Dudo think that these are really the key to doing strategic science communication because they're the things that are actionable and measurable and you can do them in a relatively short time so you can see whether you're successful at them or not. So I'm gonna give a little bit more time to this slide when I'm talking about objectives. So at the very top left, we've got just sharing facts. This is kind of like the default control objective. Anytime you're doing science communication, you're sharing knowledge. Some other things you can do that can improve the success of your science communication are being really warm and benevolent and giving, um, or at least displaying that you're doing that when you're up on a stage trying to 
offer a sense of warmth. Um, you can show that you have integrity and are honest. There are some people out there who are worried that scientists are getting paid billions of dollars and that's why they're doing it. So if you can be really transparent about your funding um, and other conflicts of interest, um, you might even prioritize, you know, instead of spending more time to explain a piece of research that you've done, you might take some time out from your talk and be like, here's all the sources of funding that I have, and here's where you can find more about it, and here's where you can contact me to demonstrate that you have a lot of integrity and you're not hiding anything. So you might prioritize that kind of objective to a different audience. Being willing to listen is a really important one. This is something that um, I struggle with and really try to use in, especially in my relationships with people who have opposite worldviews from me. Um, I bet a lot of us struggle with holding our, well, maybe Kiwis don't struggle with telling people that they're wrong. <laughs> you guys are very polite. But I've found that, you know, in the long run, if you can develop a relationship with somebody who thinks differently from you by not battling with them on something instead just listening to their opinion and making them feel heard then in the long run they might actually want to listen to your different opinion um, and it would actually they'd be open to hearing about it too because you were open to listening to them first very important objective showing shared values um, showing that you have something in common that your identities are similar in some way um, showing that you're competent researcher, so showing that you have a lot of publications or what have you. Um, the last ones are a little bit more advanced. And honestly, I wouldn't even feel comfortable doing a lot of these things without thinking it through quite a lot first, but sharing risks and benefits. So this is the type of tactic where you would present, let's say, ooh, wildfires is a good one. I'm going back to the US next month and it's wildfire season there. And when I was growing up, there were no wildfires in the summer and now there are every summer and we have to have air purifiers in our house for the last two months of the summer. It's crazy. Um, so you might share that that's a risk to your health. Even if you're not close to the smoke and can smell the smoke, you might there's actually research that shows that it affects people's air quality all across the northern U.S. So you could share that that's a risk, even if you think you're protected from the effects of climate change. Or benefits. A lot of people try to put um, preventing the effects of climate change in monetary um, form. I forget what the word for that is. But... Um, Risks and benefits. And there's there's some science to whether people perceive losses to be worse than they perceive benefits, if that makes sense. So you're more afraid of losing something than you are of gaining something that you weren't expecting. Um, so that, this is why this one is a little bit more advanced. Sharing normative beliefs. This is, has, has anybody heard of normative beliefs before? Ooh, cool. Yeah? Oh, really? Um, yeah. So I guess, well, do you want to tell me what your explanation of norms would be? And I'll see if mine's similar. Okay. Or, or you don't have to, you can, you can politely decline. <laughs> okay. So in social science, there's several different types of norms, but essentially it boils down to perceiving a behavior by others as normal. So kind of, it has to do a little bit with identity too, is seeing something that somebody else is doing as the normal thing. So for example, if you walked into the lecture hall and everybody was standing up and not sitting down, you'd probably, I mean, there's, there's research, like haven't you ever seen those crazy trick things where they make people do crazy things by just having everybody else in the room do something weird and then they end up doing it? I mean, it's, it's, they're very powerful. Normative beliefs are powerful. Um, finally, emotions or frames. Another really advanced topic because, for example, in climate change, we all know that 
we're so, I mean, we care about it, but we're so tired of hearing the, that it's not only bad, it's worse every single day. Like that's old news. And you can only take so much before you just have to go, I don't want to hear it anymore. So in some instances, it is really powerful to get people's heartstrings going and to show them a polar bear. And that, that does work in some instances, but you have to be really strategic about, is it too much? Is it time for a different emotion now? And frames means portraying a topic um, in a way that relates to a different topic that the person is interested in. I don't have an example off the top of my head for this one. Yeah, I'm just gonna skip that one. This is too long of a slide. Okay, the last one is cultivating self-efficacy, which just means like believing in yourself that you're getting better when you're doing something. That's actually important to you reaching your goals to, to continue believing that you're improving. Um, so they picked this big set of, I think it's 12 um, objectives based on a couple of social science theories that I just wanted to show really quick, the integrative model of organizational trust. So the objectives that I shared of portraying warmth and integrity and listening and shared values, those are all things that will help build trust. And if you remember back on the behavior slide, trust was sort of that pseudo behavior of accepting science and being willing to to say, okay, science has a role here. Yes. Um, I, I, I was looking forward to you saying something about the share value thing and then you skipped it um, because I, I have, I feel that that's a really, really important skill to acquire. And I would argue that the other five points that are currently on the screen are all, the other four points are all tied together, but I would put the scientific facts the last. Oh yeah. Right. Because as soon as people realize who you are, they sort of assume that that's going to be the first thing you do, that you're going to be preaching at them. Mm -hmm. And you need to break that expectation, yeah. right? So first and foremost, you talk to people as people, not as your students, not people who are intellectually inferior and need your, need your, need your, your, your knowledge shower down on them, right? Um, first of all, basically treat them as, as you would treat your neighbor. I mean, unless you lecture at your neighbor, then in, in which case, don't don't treat them like your neighbor. But treat them like an, every person you would meet, right? Try and find common ground first. And then finding that common ground, of course, requires that you listen. Because if you speak the whole time, you don't know where they stand, right? And then when you when you say when they say something that you disagree with, you would have to you would have to disagree. Because if you don't disagree, you don't show that integrity, right? You you know because. And and there are people out there whose beliefs will not be changed. And then so whether you disagree or agree with them, pretend to agree with them makes no difference. But you have to be honest, right? That honesty shows you your, your integrity, but you have to be sympathetic. You have to understand where they come from, right? So somebody whose family has been in the oil business for a long, long time, not a baron, but just a driller, you have to understand that this is what, you know, they're they're scraping by and this is the, the lifestyle that they know. Right. And so you can't be unsympathetic and say, well, you're part of the oil machine. Well, that doesn't work. You're not convincing anybody. Right. So find out who you are and then who not find out who they are. And then you can start finding shared values and identity. And then you can start thinking about, well, okay, which parts, what, what facts and processes are relevant for you, for our discussion going forward? Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate your, the way that you tied all of the, objectives together and the way that you phrased some really important objectives and tactics of science communication that sometimes I forget to say because maybe I'm too close to the to the subject yeah that was great to hear that you're doing that and you value that yeah thank you Um, this is the other theory that they've used to develop these. And this theory is probably one of the most popular behavior change theories in social science. However, 
these are all for the objectives that I was saying were a little bit more tricky, the like sharing emotions and frames and normative beliefs. So that's just to tell you where the theory comes from. So now we've got this whole strategic set of, I would call these indicators um, in an evaluation. You've got the goals that you want to happen in the long term, the behavior changes. You've got a bunch of objectives to pick from, which are all focused on changing people's beliefs and emotions um, and tactics that can back that up. So to see if you've actually progressed and are achieving those goals, you've got to add in some evaluation. And that's where this gets tricky because how do you measure if I've portrayed warmth in my science communication or if I've demonstrated integrity. That's that's our evaluation actually is a little bit hard and mysterious because, well, I mean, researchers have to do this too. You have to figure out ways to measure things that will tell you important things. <laughs> so luckily, Bessley and Dudo have started doing this for us. They've created both um, scales and survey questions for measuring if people have perceived you as warm and also their sort of baseline attitudes towards science in general. They've found that these four on the left here, competence, listening, integrity, and showing warmth were key to trust overall. So they've really encouraged in like several publications to prioritize those things if you wanna be trustworthy in your audience. And they also have this nice one of self-efficacy, which I know self-efficacy might seem a little bit silly or I don't need to do that. I don't need to remind myself that I'm improving at things. But one thing that I've learned um, coming into qualitative research, because I used to be a pretty quantitative fisheries ecologist and adapting to qualitative research was quite the ordeal. To, I mean, I'm still doing it. I had, I had to write a whole journal about my feelings about how did I even pick this PhD. But eventually I've gotten to the place where I realized like it really does matter when you when you consistently check in with yourself about how you're improving and changing. In, in social science, we'd call this reflexivity, considering your positionality towards others that you're um, working with or communicating to in terms of power dynamics, in terms of trust, in terms of relationships, um, and also how you can improve. So don't, I guess I'm saying don't knock self-efficacy. It's it's a good one too. And this this scale is really like they they've put it all there already for you and validated it. Um if you guys are interested in other types of evaluation, let's see how much time do I have left? Oh good. I'm wrapping it up just in time. So I didn't have time to put in every single great evaluation instrument and rubric and indicator that I could. I really prioritize those ones because I like Vesely and Dudos. They, they're they pretty much the only one that really tied it to theory really clearly. But there's all types of surveys and interview guides and scales and um I've put the most helpful ones here, and I can send these to you later if you want to look up any of them. Um, yeah, I guess I'll wrap up now. My takeaways are evaluation is not that mysterious. You don't have to always think of it as some person coming in and telling you how bad you're doing. It's actually something that we all do all the time, um, and you can do yourself if you want to. Um, if you don't want to, I also have a little part at the end about how you can hire an evaluator to see if you're reaching your goals or work with a PhD student. <laughs> um, metrics are important. Vanity metrics are not helpful in a lot of cases. Um, and evaluation is part of this process of thinking strategically to, to make sure that we're reaching our goals for science communication. Because if we care about it, 
enough to put our free time, because I know we don't get much credit for doing science communication, to put our free time in the science communication, you want to make sure that you're actually causing some change with it, right? You want to make sure you're doing something with it. So that's what evaluation can help you do in the strategic process. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I forgot to check the chat. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Can you hear me? I should probably type back to you. I guess I'll put a little reminder. Like, I would love it if you all could tell me what seemed like the most helpful thing, what seemed like I didn't get that at all or like take that out next time, or if, if there's something you really wanted me to cover and I didn't cover it. Let me just do the microphone. I think all these extra steps on today, guys. Thanks, that was wonderful. <laughs> Um, my question is to do with what if you do science communication as a job, so you're not the researcher, but you're in that super awesome situation between the researcher and between the public, where do you plug into this information and what you've learned? Yeah, well, I'm assuming that's what you do. Um, no, actually, but I thought about it. Yeah. Um, so here's the thing. In other countries, evaluation is a lot more important for that kind of role because impact is a big deal and, and is required to be evaluated in the UK, for example. Um, here, I think it's helpful. Um, MB does, oh, does everybody know what I mean when I say impact? Actually, that's, that's a bad way to phrase it. Let's just go talk about impact for a second. Impact is basically another way to say long-term changes in societal level um, indicators like well-being and environment that result from your research. Um, it's very hard to demonstrate that your research has a causal connection to lots of types of impact. Um, therefore, it requires special types of evaluation that include that causality. And I bring that up because MB, for example, wants all of its endeavor funds to include this line of sight to impact. So this is where it could be really helpful to somebody in a professional sense. If you could say, I can make you a stellar line of sight to impact because I know how to measure these different phases and show that you're having the, you're meeting the goals that you want to meet. That's where I think it becomes more important. That said, I feel like everybody could benefit from learning a little bit by getting more feedback from evaluation and, and thinking about what they do. Um, as frequently as they can. I sit down after almost everything I do, every interview I have, every talk I give, sometimes just interactions with people in my department and give myself a little review, give myself a little evaluation of how I did and what I should do differently next time. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So in addition to like a an end of either event or something evaluation, um, is there value in also having um, a during 
evaluation, something that kind of assesses the the progress of something before you've reached that end point um, where you would typically have something at the beginning to say, this is the baseline, this is what it's at the end, and then kind of progress. Yeah, I decided to take that slide out. So thank you for there. Yeah, because this is a little bit too table, it's too much of a table for a slide. So I didn't really, it wasn't quite there yet. But basically what this is trying to show is that um, if you're still pretty early in the science communication activity you're doing, if you're still developing it, like Chris is doing right now, you probably don't have enough information to say, I'm going to evaluate my impacts that are going to happen several years down the line. What would be really helpful is for you to figure out some indicators that you are making the correct activity for your goal. It's going to going to be able to meet that goal, that you're meeting the needs of the community that you're trying to work with. And then as you start to implement it, that that you're actually able to deliver on the plan that you've made. That's a type of evaluation called a process evaluation. So yeah, there's there are many, many different types of evaluation. And it's all about meeting your need where you are at the time and you're it kind of goes hand in hand with program development so that it can develop that baseline for you um oh gosh thanks lisa so one of the things that I want to like achieve with the podcast that I'm working on the science book subscribe now on Spotify and iTunes is we're interview we're interviewing like um, scientists and we want to like not only talk to them about their research but while we do like the part of the reason to do it as like an interview based thing is to like show the wider public like the people behind research which isn't like done in a lot of places I don't think and it's, yeah, kind of getting at what you were alluding to before about like the scientists are normal human people, yeah. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that fits in like, the kind of big like goal slide you have and how would that be something to like evaluate? Oh, I think that fits right in. Actually, there's a scale for that. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that's probably part trust and part identity and part career goals. Um, but if you just want to see if you like can inspire your listeners to um, think more broadly about what a scientist looks like, I mean, there's a whole initiative called This is What a Scientist Looks Like. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, yeah. So there's literally a scale for that to like measure if, if a before and after, if they've changed, if they've started thinking more broadly about it. Um, yeah, great question. I hope you do that. Let's talk more. Yeah, that would be cool. The thing uh, the thing that I was like hoping somebody would ask me, and if there's no more questions and there's time, maybe I'll just say it anyway. And it's time. Okay. So another thing about social media is you need to get, you kind of need to build a funnel so that you can get access to your audience at the level that they'll be able to take the survey or to tell you how their thoughts about scientists have changed. So um, do you know what I mean by a funnel? You have like a, a freebie on your website and people give you their email address. Um, I'm still pretty new to university ethics systems. So I don't know if that might need an ethics approval or not. But if you are going to do that, you might want to look into it and, and see. Yeah, okay, I'll wrap up now. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jess. That was amazing. Uh, thanks to um, everyone for being so interactive as well. Um, yeah, we're going to go and have some lunch, I think, down at the lake because it's a lovely day. Um, so if anyone would like to join us, you're very welcome to come along and have more of a chat. And if you have feedback for Jess, feel free to just send it to me um, and I shall pass on. I would really, really love 
your harshest criticism. She really wants feedback, genuinely. So that, that's helpful to yeah. my research. She's very resilient. <laughs> person, so. cool. Thank you. Thanks, awesome. everyone.